Good evening and blessings as we welcome you to the relationship series of virtual conversation. We are continuing in job title worshiper, understanding the position of worship leader. We are on chapter three, answering question number three. When is a worshiper a worshiper? A worshiper is a worshiper at all times because it is a lifestyle. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so grateful that you give us the opportunity once again to come together virtually to study your word and to bless your name. We ask even now that as we look into your word, God, specifically as we look at the challenges that Job faced, that God, you show us how we can be provoked to worship. We bless you for every test and trial that comes our way. We celebrate you that you've already ordained for us to be more than conquerors. You set us as victors in the earth and we bless you even now for what you're doing through us, for us, and by us. Even now in Jesus' name, amen. Provoked to worship. We stopped last week as we were talking about confusing the enemy by worshiping when his intention is to trouble us to the point that we lose our faith and our focus. Well, today we're going to be talking about Joseph as we continue on in chapter three, and we're looking specifically at how he was provoked to worship when the enemy had another plan. So let's jump right in to page number 19. We're talking now about God's testimony. In Job chapter 1 verses 8 through 12, we see that Satan believed that the worshiper Job only chose to worship God because his health, wealth, and wholeness were provided and sustained by God. God listened and laughed as Satan told him that the only reason Job chose to worship him was because God not only gave him everything he wanted, but he also protected him and his things. Satan did not believe that Job would choose to worship God if he was going through. What faith God had in Job to allow him to endure the things that he endured and know that Job would still give glory to him. It must have been his lifestyle. God had a testimony about Job that he stood on and was never removed from, despite all the things that Job went through. Chapter 2 tells us that God's testimony about Job never changed. There are some things that we encounter that can change our countenance. There are things that we can encounter that can change our belief system. There are some things we can encounter that can even change how we interact and respond to what's going on around us. But the one thing that God wants to count on is that our faith will not fail. God has been true to us and his desire is that we stand firm in the truth that he will always be good to us. When we look at what God has done, he gives us his divine presence. He gives us his divine provision. He gives us his divine protection. And God is consistent with his blessings to us. He's not a delinquent dad. He's not a deadbeat dad. He's not an absent father. God, Abba Father, is there with us all the time, giving us the opportunity to enjoy his presence, to engage with his provision, and to embrace his protection. God consistently and faithfully provides for us. It is when we're challenged that our faithfulness is questioned. It's when we find ourselves dealing with trouble, dealing with trial, dealing with tests, dealing with tribulation, that we actually are getting a gauge of where our faith is. Does trouble tend to make you lose faith in God? Does trouble tend to make you worry instead of worship? Does trouble 
tend to bring you to a place where you're totally off focus from God and tuned out from his voice, engaging us in conversation with him to instruct us. What does trouble provoke you to do? Today's conversation is all about trouble provoking us to worship. God trusted Job's faith so much so that he brought Job to the enemy's attention. Yes, God brought Job to the enemy's attention. When the enemy had his conversation with God and God asked him where he was and he responded, I've been going back and fro throughout the earth trying to find someone to devour. God's response mm -hmm. to that comment was, have you considered my servant, Job? And it's interesting that God's faith in Job's faith was so strong that he actually turned the enemy's attention to his servant. God's testimony about Job was a firm testimony because God knew that Job's faith would not fail. Even though he was tested, God knew that Job's faith would not fail. It's interesting that Job finds himself in this place because of his faith. There are times when we ask, why me? We ask, why now? We ask, why, God, am I enduring these trials? Why am I having to continually face tribulation? And our faith is the thing that caused the enemy to focus on us. Let's go back to job title worshiper and, and take a look at God's permission for the attack. Job chapter one, verse five tells us that Job sent for his children, sanctified them, arose early in the morning and offered burnt offerings, all because he said they may have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. The Bible records that Job did this continually. A man that would be continually concerned about his children being in right standing with God must have had a personal relationship with him himself. A meeting was held that Job knew nothing about. He was not a participant in the conversation, although he was the topic of the discussion. Permission was given to Satan by God to touch the possessions of Job. A series of what we would call catastrophes followed. The report came to Job that the Sabians took his oxen and asses and all of the servants tending them were killed except the one making the report. While this report was being discussed, the second report was delivered. It was reported that fire from God had descended from heaven and consumed the sheep and the servants that tended them. Once again, only the one making the report was spared. While that report was being discussed, the third report was delivered. This report shared that the Chaldeans had taken away the camels and killed the servants that tended them, sparing only the one that was making the report. Every animal that was listed in verse three as Job's additional substance had been taken. And then came the final report. A great wind from the wilderness had destroyed the house where his children were and everyone was killed. As a true worshiper, you must know that given the opportunity, Satan will attack you. And when he does, he will make sure that someone is available and motivated to make sure that you get the bad report. Remember, he's counting on the bad news, causing you to lose your focus. Job had a personal faith with his personal God. While in the midst of being faithful, in one single day, Job encounters four separate attacks. First comes the Sabians. Now, you may ask, who are the Sabians? The Sabians are from the ancient South Arabian area. 
And the land that they occupied was known as the biblical land of Sheba. This particular group was wealthy. This wealthy group came into Job's territory, took his oxen, took his donkeys, and killed all of his servants but one, the Sabians. The second attack was identified as a fire that had come down from God. Interesting. A fire that had come down from God. This fire consumed Abraham's sheep. It also killed all of his servants, except for the one making the report. After the second attack, Job is then informed that the Chaldeans have attacked. Who are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans were from the South Babylonian area. And what's interesting about this group of people, they were actually descendants of Nahor. Who is Nahor, you ask? Nahor is the brother of Abraham. So Job has been now attacked the third time on the same day by descendants of the father of faith. Descendants of the father of faith challenge Job's faith. The descendants of the father of faith bring the third attack. The final attack that Job endured on that day was reported by the only servant who made it out of that attack to make the report. And the report was that a wind from the wilderness, interesting, again, the wind from the wilderness came against the house that Job's children were in, collapsed the house and killed his children. So in one day, Job lost his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his camels. He lost all but three of the servants that were charged with managing his animals. And he lost all of his children. That's bad news. The Bible tells us, though, that for each of these attacks, there was someone assigned to tell Job that the attack had happened. There was someone assigned to bring word back of the catastrophe that had occurred. Job gets these reports back to back, one after the other, on the same day as an earlier report is being given. He's attacked in such a way that there's multi-levels of feelings that had to be going on in that moment. He's lost livestock, he's lost personnel, and he's lost family. As we've endured the ravages of COVID-19, many of us have experienced multiple losses. As difficult as each and every loss is, Job gives us the example of how to manage those losses, how to manage the emotions behind those losses by being provoked to worship. Let's go back to job title worshiper to see how Job sees God through the challenge. In verse 21, Job said, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was not bitter about his loss, but he saw it as God's gain. He must have understood that what he had 
belonged to God and respected that God could do what he chose with what belonged to him. Job sustained so much loss, yet he continued to give God praise. It had to be because of his relationship with God. After hearing these four bad reports, one immediately following the other, what does Job do? Verse 20 records his reaction to so much bad news. He got up, he tore his mantle, shaved his head, got down on the ground and worshiped. We see Job after losing his children and possessions, worshiping God. Job was able, despite all of the emotions that must have been churning within him at hearing these four bad reports, he was able to look through the challenge and see God. He pronounces to everyone who's in listening range that the Lord gives and the Lord takes. He understood that everything he had belonged to God. He understood that everything he had, he was the stewarding manager of that thing that belonged to God. He understood that his time in possessing the things that he had was seasonal, that God had given him a window of time in order to manage the thing that he placed in his hand. Job understood that everything he had ultimately belonged to God. When he found himself in the place of acknowledging that what he had was gone, he proclaimed, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken. Job intentionally kept his focus on the God that he served. His faith did not fail, but his faith was fortified in trouble. Today's conversation is all about us embracing the truth that when God allows trouble to come into our lives, he allows it to fortify our faith. When we are tested and tried, we choose to stand on God's word and trust that his love for us will continue to make us victors, will continue to keep us as more than conquerors, will continue to uphold us and undergird us as God takes us from the place that we are to the place that he would have us to be. Trouble is designed to provoke us to worship. When we understand that God allows trouble to enter our lives, not to harm us, not to break us down, not to destroy us, but he allows trouble to build us up, to make us strong, to undergird our faith. So we go from glory to glory, from strength to strength, and from faith to faith. God's intention for the things that come in our lives to buffet us, even though they're at the hand of the enemy. God's intention is for those troubles, those trials, those tests to bring out of us the word of God that has been seated within us, that our faith will be fortified and our trust in God multiplied. God intends for trouble to provoke us to worship. It takes a focused faith to be in a place that when we go through, we don't operate out of a perspective of trouble. It takes a focused faith to embrace what God is doing in the season of trouble and stand on his word, knowing that all good things work together for the good to those who are called according to his purpose. Yes, God has a purpose for the persecution that you're enduring and his purpose is for it to provoke us 
to worship. For when we believe the word of God, we know that what we endure has reward at the end. There is a reward on the other side of through. So in the midst of my trouble, in the midst of my test, in the midst of my trial, in the midst of my tribulation, do I have feelings? Yes, I do. I embrace the word of God. I rise above how I feel and I am provoked to worship because I know that God is a loving father who does well for all of his children. I embrace God in the midst of trouble and I am provoked to worship. Trouble can take us to a whole new place in God. Trouble can promote us to a whole new place in God. Trouble can reveal to us a whole new place in God. See your trouble today for the opportunity that it is. God wants to promote you and it's in the midst of trouble that we're provoked to worship because we know that God loves us unconditionally and wants to give us wonderful gifts. So today, if you found yourself in a place of complaining, if you found yourself in a place of worrying, if you find yourself in a place of aggravation and frustration, recognize the hand of God in the midst of trouble and be provoked to worship. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that regardless of where we are, regardless of what we're dealing with, regardless of the choices that we've made, God, that you're always present with us, that you are our divine supply. You provide for us consistently. And God, you offer us your divine protection. We recognize that when we, God, embrace your presence, when we embrace your provision, when we embrace your protection, we position ourselves to walk through every trial that comes our way. We position ourselves to run out of every test as a victor. We position ourselves, God, to engage in every tribulation, knowing that we have already won. God, we thank you even now that the testimony that you had for Job, God, that it is our testimony. We recognize that the enemy can't do anything to us without your permission. The enemy can't reach us without your permission. The enemy cannot touch anything that's connected to us without your permission. And God, we thank you even now that you are the orchestrator of our lives. We thank you that through your presence, God, you continue to encourage us. Through your presence, God, you continue to protect us. And through your presence, God, you continue to provide everything that we need so that we can walk out your purpose, your will, God, your way. God, we're so thankful that when tests come our way, God, that we already know that you've equipped us to win. We thank you that when tribulation troubles us, God, we already know that you have called us more than conquerors. And God, we're so thankful that everything you allow us to come through, God, that you allow it to bring us to. God, we honor you for bringing us to new places. God, we celebrate you for the promotions that you've assigned to us. God, we thank you for the work that you're placing in our hands when we get to the other side of through. And we're so excited, God, that we are able to partner with you to have a positive impact in the earth and to bring your light to those who are living in darkness. We bless you and we praise you for all things are done according to your plan, God. 
We recognize that even as we plan, God, even as we strategize, that we have to listen to your voice so that we know what step to take, when to take it, how to take it, who to take it with. We bless you even now for your divine instruction, God. We bless you for the divine strategies that you're releasing to us so that we can be successful in all that you've called us to do. We thank you for blessing us with listening ears, God, so that we can hear you faithfully and with clarity. We are so blessed that you, God, want to be in relationship with us and you allow us to connect with you in an intimate relationship with you. Thank you for all that you're doing in the earth. Thank you for this amazing partnership. Thank you for the equipping and the empowering that you're giving us, God, so that we can walk worthy of the call that you have called us to. We bless you and we praise you even now in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that you keep finding yourself in the midst of trouble, but God is still in control and his intention for us is to allow our troubles to provoke us to worship. Blessings.